the rationale for checkpoint combination is really just um, uh, different and complementary ways to stimulate the immune response. So while uh, checkpoint inhibitors are largely directed against PD-1 or PD-L1, you know, adding in a CTLA-4 blockade should augment T cell stimulation, which is the whole trick, obviously, of immunotherapy. So while there's certainly more toxicity to combination therapy, you know, I tell patients, you know, PD-1 monotherapy is about the easiest drug that I give in terms of side effects, really easy. If you nevo, combination therapy is, is not, right? Not, I wouldn't necessarily call it easy. It's certainly not the easiest. So, so there is some toxicity cost, but although they've not been directly compared, um, you know, it's clear to me that combination therapy it ha is more active, more complete responses, probably think deeper and more durable responses. Checkmate 214 was a, a very interesting result for our patients. Prior to that study, we had nivolumab or PD-1 blockade approved for patients who had failed VEGF therapy. Checkmate 214 was an attempt to bring PD-1 blockade into the front line by combining it with CTLA-4 blockade with ipilimumab. That's an proven effective strategy in melanoma patients, so we were bringing that regimen or that combination to our patients in, with kidney cancer, comparing it to the standard of care, which is sunitinib. And that head-to-head -head phase three trial was a very positive study. It met most of its primary endpoints, including a significant overall improvement in overall response rate, most importantly, overall survival, as well as quality of life favored the combination regimen. Interestingly, the side effect profile was actually, when you look at grade three, four toxicity, was actually less in the combination than with sunitinib, which surprised many of us. So we saw more clinical efficacy than we expected, less toxicity. Now, the toxicity may have been less in part because the regimen in kidney cancer is different than the regimen in melanoma, where melanoma, the dose of ipilimumab is higher and nivolumab is lower. In kidney cancer, it's the inverse of that, so there's more nevo driving the, uh, probably the benefit in patients with kidney cancer, and that's improved the sort of toxicity profile, the applicability in the clinic. Is, it's made it easier to give. So this is, these results are not just statistically significant, but I think they're clinically meaningful. Finally seeing overall survival, which we've struggled to get in our patients with advanced kidney cancer with prior treatments. And probably most importantly for me, it's not only we're seeing responses, but we're seeing complete responses and approximately 10% of patients, um, which in the past, in, with immune therapies like high-dose interleukin-2, it's those complete responses that have actually been able to develop a remission of their disease, and some of those patients are actually cured. So it'll be very interesting to see when we follow that ipilimumab, nivolumab story, whether those patients with those deep responses are actually entering remissions of their disease, which is the first step to curing their advanced cancer, which is, you know, is, is very exciting. And one important part of the trial, which was also interesting, is the benefit with it being a NEVO was greatest in the worst prognostic groups like intermediate and poor risk, as I was mentioning earlier, whereas the good risk patients, at least in the early markers of efficacy, did better with sunitinib. So both groups benefited, and we got a sense that maybe one group could start off with a VEGF targeted strategy, intermediate and poor might benefit from an IO-IO combination, but we saw benefits across the board for the patients on the trial. Bevacizumab plus interferon was sort of the original VEGF plus IO um, back in the day. It wasn't used much after its approval, although it was clearly active, I think in part because of the interferon toxicity. Uh, number one, interferon is subcutaneous. Nobody really likes to do that. It's three times a week, and it produces flu-like symptoms. So it wasn't a great partner for bevacizumab. Uh, Bev by itself is, is active and, and really well tolerated, but the interferon sort of dragged it down. So it wasn't used much, to e used much even after approval, and, and I'm not sure anybody's really using it today. And with these new combos, no way.